Hi, I'm Alex White, and uh, if you aren't aware, I've run for mayor twice in Rochester. And one of my big things is a Bernie issue. Uh, Bernie has been talking a lot about corporate welfare. And as a national issue, it's a great issue. But the problem is, what's affecting you more is not the corporate welfare in Albany or New York or uh, Washington. It's the corporate welfare right here in Rochester done by Democrats. The city has been controlled by Democrats for 40 years. So everything you see here is a result of a Democrat. And this is what's, this is the thing that's making us poor. Corporate welfare in Rochester. Our problem is, our problem is huge and it's being done here by the party we all recognize and it's why we cannot afford nice things here in Rochester. And they do it in so many ways. The first and perhaps the biggest and is these tax breaks. It seems that the only way our politicians can think of any way to, to try to help something is by giving them tax breaks. And these are going to be now pictures of buildings you might recognize. This is Erie Harbor. Erie, Har Erie Harbor is a housing development with 300 apartments in it. And uh, not one of them pays a rent that yearly that is more, that is uh, less than the amount of, uh, that, uh, that is less than the amount of the yearly taxes. What that means is that the taxes on one of these 300 apartments will pay will more than pay for their taxes for the whole year. The assessed value of the building is also roughly equal to the rent their gross rent receipts for the year. So this is a building, this is a building that has been given huge tax breaks. And one of the things that you think is that what you think tax breaks are about, it's not. Because over and over again, these are going to be residential properties that are getting these breaks. And residential properties are not creating jobs, they're not increasing the economy, they're not making things, they're not making people better. And one of the frightening things about it is, Rochester currently has a vacancy rate of about 12% of all apartments or houses are presently vacant. If, if you are going to give tax breaks for something that you need, that may be a legitimate argument. But housing is one of the few things that you can argue we do not need more of in Rochester. Sure, some of the housing needs work and money put into it. But we do not need more apartments because there is a huge glut already. And for many reasons, including the huge vacancy number, economic laws are not applying to the price of rents. So even though there's a huge vacancy rate and more being thrown on the market every year, the, uh, city, the, uh, the city is not lowering rents for people by doing this. So we're getting higher rent, high rents, and huge tax breaks, and no jobs for our spending. And if you go downtown, like the Warner Building, it's near the YMCA, this is a project that was renovated recently, and the press city says it's worth $5 million, but it only pays 34000 of the almost 200000 it should be paying in taxes. And Taxes in Rochester are the are one basically one of the three ways we generate our money is property taxes. The property tax collected are close to a third of the total revenue of the city. The tax rate for what they call homesteads or single houses is two, is roughly two percent, and the tax breaks for the uh, uh, larger commercial properties, industrial properties, and uh, large housing complexes like this one at Anthony Square on West Main Street should be paying 4%. Yet, the vast majority of these big projects, regardless of when they were built, are not, are not paying taxes on them. And you would think that it might be new things, and everyone said the tax breaks would expire eventually and then we'll get money for them. But right on Main Street, in fact, you can probably see it from outside, is the Cedar Towers. Cedar Towers was built in 1973 and has never paid taxes. It presently pays only 
$8,600 taxes on a building that complex that has over 700 apartments. And it, the city claims is worth, the city claims it's worth over $4 million, but pays less than some houses not far away on East Avenue. And built in 73, they frequently roll these tax breaks over after they expire or the building sells to a new owner, like what happened at Bridges Square Apartments, a new owner buys it and claims he needs to do some work on it and therefore needs new tax breaks. So they never expire. The, uh, and the, uh, uh, what do I got here? Plymouth Main Townhouses. Uh, the, uh, the uh, housing was frequently put into areas that frequently had single family houses in it. And single family houses almost inevitably have a lower rent than the low income housing they're putting over it. So the argument that this is to create low income housing is not true at all. And Anthony Square Apartment, the Plymouth townhouses are great examples of low income housing that raised the rents on properties they displaced. And yet are still receive are still receiving this one, $670,000 in tax breaks every year. The uh, um, uh, Corn Hill, another area in which they tore down low-income houses and put new low-income housing on it. And uh, the Riverside Apartments, which this is one of my favorites because this is a new construction this is, a, this is a new construction that was put in for college students. The U of R rents every single apartment in it. And the college students, this is right on Plymouth Avenue, right after, opposite the college, right next to the lower footbridge. And these apartments, these, regardless of what they do, these apartments are going to pay less in taxes than a student is going to pay for one semester to stay there. And, but there are, it's not, just, it's not just residential properties. Many of the large commercial buildings that you see in Rochester also, suffer, also receive the same benefits. And Legacy, Legacy Tower, which was the old Bausch and Lomb building downtown, was built in the 90s and had a special tax agreement that was going to expire in 2015. Well, fortunately, Buckingham Properties and Morgan bought the building in 2015 for $26 million and claimed that they could never make it profitable if they had to pay taxes on it. And so the city made a new 20-year agreement with them in which they would pay $22,000 of the roughly 1.1 million dollars they should be paying. And these agreements, like recently the city reassessed all the properties in the city which raised the rate for many people. These buildings with these deals, none of them get reassessed and none of them have their property taxes raised as a result of the value going up. Brooks Landing which is an iconic structure, which was a wonderful thing to save the neighborhood, has rental costs of $14 a square foot, which is more than twice what you could rent property across the street from it for at $6. As a result, a series of restaurants and uh, coffee shops have rotated in and out of this, failing consistently. And yet, the city makes them pay only $2,500 taxes a year on an on a building that's worth more than a million dollars. The Culver Road Armory right up the street here on, uh, is, on uh, Culver Road is one of the many buildings that is almost a pet peeve of mine. This property in Old Military Base was sold at auction and uh, uh, was sold at auction and bought for one bought for 1.5 million dollars. It was then received $3 million of city money, and the developer threw $11 million into it. All this money resulted in the developer, a law firm, 
an accounting firm and an engineering firm moving their businesses to there from places downtown. It, the only new businesses in there are the restaurant that was created for it and uh, a gallery and some other small commercial properties. And this property, this property has never and will not for 20 years pay any taxes on a building on a building that has basically created vacant properties in downtown Rochester. The Merkel Donahue building housed two of their tenants and now is a vacant shell in downtown. And we made that happen. On Westfall Road, our set of townhouses, there were three of them on Westfall Road. These townhouses were built in the late 60s, early 70s. These townhouses are all assessed, there are multiple comp, three complexes there, and they're all assessed roughly around four million dollars. Yet, none of them pay taxes. Most recently, this one at 380 Westfall Road went to the city of Rochester in 2010 and claimed, oh my God, we need to put in new carpet, new countertop, and new cabinets in the kitchens, otherwise we're going to have to close them down. And we need tax breaks for the next 30 years so that we can do what must be considered normal operations for every rental business in the planet. And as a result, as a result, they pay $4,500 of the $350,000 in taxes. And over the life, over the life of this, they're going to receive roughly ten million dollars of tax breaks. The, uh, there's another one of the apartment complexes right next door receiving millions of dollars of tax breaks. And if you think that these are about job creation, all I have to, all I can say is microwave data systems. If you've never heard of it, they make long-range microwave transmission used for the cable television industry. Uh, this is a business started here in Rochester. It employs about 250 people and they decided to build a new building for themselves on Science Boulevard in 2002, finished in 2004. This building they built for $2.8 million and it pays its full share of taxes, $85,000. This is, this is one of the very few ones that is actually a manufacturing building and actually creates jobs. And of all the pictures I've shown you, it is the only one also that pays full taxes. Now if you think I'm cherry picking, downtown there's a bunch of towers. Maybe you've heard of them. There's the Chase Tower, the Xerox Tower. Um, there's a couple housing towers on, uh, on uh, Broad Street. There's a whole pile of these buildings. None of them pay their full taxes. In fact, almost in every case, if you look at any large property in your area, I, would make a, I could make a very strong argument that they are not paying their full taxes. In total, there are 155 properties worth more than a million dollars that according to the city records receive $35 million in tax breaks every year. Now these are, you will be unable to look this up, but next you can get your hands on the 2012 city tax records, but from 2012 these were the numbers. If only this was all there was. Well they give tax breaks, they also seriously under assess properties that are large in the city. And this underassessment, because taxes are based on the assessment <coughs> of the property, when they underassess it, you pay much less. Many of these properties, like Alexander Park, which is the old Genesee Hospital building, um, Buckingham has put $89 million into this property, building these buildings. And the assessed value of them is, is a mere $24 million. So even if they were to pay their full taxes, like even if there was a time that the tax breaks would expire for them, they would still be paying a third of what their real taxes should be because the underassessing. Voters Block 
was built for $20 million, all public money on West Main Street. It has the absolutely fantastic 1872 cafe in there, and I highly recommend that. Salvatore's has done a great job saving it. But this building, which was built for $20 million, is assessed for a mere uh, uh, is assessed for a mere $940,000. What I would call the worst investment anyone has ever made in their entire life. Yeah. The Cornhill Landing uh, is a special case because to build this, the city loaned the developer $20 million. Ooh. And it's part of this, uh, uh, so despite a $20 million loan to the city, the city only assesses the value at $7.5 million. If this was a private housing that was built and was built for three times the value of the actual assessed value of the housing, that's fraud which sends you to jail, is the amigos can tell you when they committed their housing fraud doing exactly this, building houses for building houses, claiming it was built for much more, taking out loans for more than the value, and then the houses are found to be assessed at far below what they were selling for. That's what is going on here at Cornhill Landing. And the city, remember, owns a more, still is getting payment on a loan for three times the value of the assessed property. So under even if they closed up and said this is never going to work the value of that property according to the city will not cover their loan Nathnagel Realty which is a business um, it was a building that was renovated in a Cascade district for 4.5 million dollars almost all of it public money and yet the city claims that despite all that work Nathnagel was only able to make it worth $825,000 at the end. A realtor that apparently knows nothing about, the, about how to value properties. The uh, Kirstein building, uh, uh, the Kirstein building is another one which is almost all housing, again, built, uh, uh, renovated downtown to put apartments in it, and yet assessed at a quarter the value quarter the value of the building. And perhaps the worst example is the Xerox Tower. The Xerox Tower sold in 2012 for $39 million to Buckingham Property, a name that I just can't mention enough times in this, apparently. This building despite selling for $39 million, is still only assessed today in 2016 for $13 million, a third of what the sale price was. You will never be able to buy a house in the city and have them assess the property the third what you paid for it. That isn't how it works. Almost in any case, if a property sells, all properties around it are going to be reassessed based on the sale value of that property. And this property sold for roughly $96 per square foot, one of the common ways to determine valuation of property. It also pays $15 million yearly in rent, another common way to assess properties. Um, normally, they think somewhere between three and four times the rent value can be used as an assessment value, which would put their property between 39 and $52 million. And $96 per square foot would be a set price. What this would mean is that properties like the Chase Building, the Chase Tower, the beautiful white tower downtown, should be assessed somewhere in that neighborhood of $96 per square foot. It is unfortunately not. It is assessed at, it is assessed at $9 million, which puts an assessment per square feet at at a wonderful $13 per square foot. The, um, uh, 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 the Legacy Tower, which I showed earlier, even at it also, at 20, when it sold for $26,000, was $89 per square foot. The Sibley Building is presently assessed at $4.5 per square foot. And this 
under all circumstances of a house sold on your street, they would use that to try to raise your taxes. But for these big properties downtown, there is no need to worry about things like that. The, uh, and in case you thought they only got tax breaks, Erie Harbor, my favorite, is uh, uh, a set of lovely buildings on Mount Hope. If you haven't seen them, I recommend you don't. Yeah. The, uh, 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 I, these, 300 built, these 300 apartments there, which they tore down low-income housing to build, replacing with apartments that start for a single, fe for a single bedroom at $1,500, um, is and built for $49 million, uh, is, is, is assessed at a mere it's assessed at a mere $7.8 million, roughly a sixth of what they built the property for. And in most places in the world, when a developer wants to build something, the, the way he makes money is he builds a building and sells the building for more than it that cost him to build it. So almost inevitably, properties are assessed at a higher value than the construction cost. But somehow Rochester breaks the trend and Erie Harbor is a fine example of a property that any fair value assessment of it would put its value in the $40 million range, if not higher, from recent sales of properties in, Erie, in the South Wedge area which has, ha which has seen a 30% increase in property values in the last five years. But yet, this property remains seriously under-assessed, but yet they have no trouble filling it at the ridiculous rates they're charging, which is almost double what you can get an apartment for across the street, down Hamilton Street or Alexander Street, or on any of the nice areas in the South Wedge. The, uh, uh, but, but there's also a lot of corruption that's going on with not-for-profits. Uh, uh, many of these not-for-profits are housing, which were, built, uh, which were built and owned in many cases by churches. And the lawsuit allowing this to happen came out of Rochester. And the Supreme Court ruled in a five to four decision that a uh, church could own as not for profit a housing complex as long as the profits went to support the church's ministries. Um, the strongest argument in my mind for removing church uh, religious institutions and making them pay taxes is this practice right here. And the R. L. Edwards Manor in uh, lovely and the lovely uh, Corn Hill area is one that was built by the church, uh, the, one of the churches on Clarissa Street, and has consistently not paid taxes as a not-for-profit, even though it's basically selling market rate housing <coughs> to senior citizens. The uh, XL Blue Cross building. XL is Blue Cross is owned by a for-profit company, which is owning a not-for-profit company, which owns this building, so this building doesn't have to pay taxes. Now, I don't even want to get into the idea that insurance is not not-for-profit by its very nature. That this is not health care. This is actually health care denier. Okay? Their job is not to provide you with care, but to make it as difficult as possible to get payment for that care. And they are able to claim themselves as a not-profit in some sort of bizarre corporate structure, even though the company that owns them is allowed to take money out of it as profits. And yet, they don't pay taxes. They don't pay taxes on their $26 million building downtown. Little Theater. Yes, I love the Little Theater as much as you do. I go there frequently. They show great films. They made a decision years ago that if they, made, could, if they could claim not-for-profit status, 
they could just increase the amount of money that the owners were able to take is basically salary, is now directors of a not-for-profit. This is a commercial movie theater. It's like the cinema or any of the larger movie theaters, the Henrietta 12 plexes. And this is not a different operation. It gets a film, it advertises, it sells tickets, it is somehow allowed to be a not-for-profit because it shows less popular films, but sells out its theaters anyways for these less popular films. And the whole purpose was to allow them to, have, to take the, uh, the $22,000 they would have been paid in the taxes and shift that to director's salary. The uh, Rochester, the Riverside Convention Center is not technically a not-for-profit. It's a government organization. It's a government-run organization, which last year lost 1.5 million dollars. To say nothing about paying any taxes on it, the city and county split that and each put in 750 thousand dollars to shore up the deficit and the spending on this. And this building, this building continues to has run into loss every year but its first three years when the Marriott Corporation operated it at a profit. The city and county decided in, in 1995 they wanted that profit and they took it over and has run it at a huge loss ever since. When Marriott owned it, at least the city and county received some money and rent for it. Since that time in 95, no rent money has been paid. The city, has, the city and county have collected nothing on a project that cost them almost $10 million to build in 92. Uh, just like this is the Regional Transit Authority. Another wonderful building built with public money for, a corporate, for, for an organization that, that has a CEO that can collect bonuses. Why a not-for-profit is able to collect bonuses and why the service, if you've ever ridden the bus, is so awesome um, uh, is beyond me. There are more complaints about, about bus service in the terrible transit system we have in Rochester. And the best thing about this is they even did a study. And their study found that what they were doing was inefficient for the time it takes to get from point A to point B and for the number of miles that the buses are traveling because they're using a hub and spoke system. If instead they used a wheel system with substations in which people could transfer from substation to substation and go from those substations to where they wanted to go in that area, they would save gas, which would, save, which would be good so we would have fewer ozone days like we had today. It would save mileage on the buses, making them last longer, and people's transit time would go down. So they even know they're doing a crappy job. And yet, this building will never pay any taxes. The, uh, 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 perhaps the worst crime that our city commits in the name of corporate profits is what I call renting what we own. Very frequently, we, we sell property to a developer and then go and do landscaping all around it. Erie Harbor Park, again, right around Erie Harbor, the beautiful buildings I recommend you never see if you can. Um, the city put, the city has put, has put six, over 600, well, they've got another 400,000 going into landscaping, putting a path there, putting art installations. They still don't have it lit. So the walkway that they have put there is a dangerous place at night, particularly for women. But we have sunk almost a million, we're sinking almost a million dollars into this, into this for, a, for something that goes behind the buildings out of public view and is out of public view and is nothing but the backyard enhancements for Erie Harbor. But this is mild by comparison to what happened at the Staybridge Hotel. At the Staybridge Hotel, the city of Rochester owned the property that this was built on. They sold this property to the developer, Christiansen's Development, for one dollar. Because 
you can't legally sell it for less. And New York State Constitution forbids them from giving the land away. So, they sold it for one dollar and then immediately turned around and bought a right of way walkway behind it for seven hundred thousand dollars. Wait, they owned it, they sold it for a dollar, they paid them seven hundred thousand dollars for a right of way on property they had owned 20 minutes earlier. Okay? But that's not the winner. Cornhill Landing. At Cornhill Landing, they also owned the entire property this was built on across from the public safety building. They sold it to the developer for one dollar and then turned around and bought it for two, bought a walkway along the back of it next to the river for two point two one million dollars and then built the walkway and path on it with our money on property that, remember, is owned by the developer. Housing for the rich. Because they, they don't need to own buildings that they can make money out of. They also have to live somewhere. And unfortunately, we can't expect them to pay taxes. So the city has passed a special tax exemption for downtown Rochester called the Urban, uh, 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 the urban Resident, uh, the, the Downtown Residential Exemption Program, which grants anyone who lives in the property they own downtown tax exemptions of 100% of for the first year, then a 90% exemption for the second year, 80% for the third, and so on, until after 10 years they will pay full taxes on the property. This makes them very attractive for people to buy if they happen to need to be able to claim residence in the city of Rochester to work for it. And a couple years ago, under Tom Richards, the deputy mayor was a man named Leonard Reardon, who bought a townhouse on Plymouth Avenue right across from City Hall for $300,000. And as a result of this exception, the first year he owned it, he paid he paid a mere $526. And if, how do you say this happens if you have a 100% exception? The city has something called easements, which pay for snow plowing and sidewalk maintenance and things. And unfortunately, they still have to pay their easements. But uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, is very similar anywhere downtown. This is a random house on University Avenue that happens to be owner-occupied. It was in its second year of, it, of, the, pro, of the deal. Uh, it was in its uh, second year of the deal and pays $867,000. Alexander Park is not downtown. It is on Alexander Street. How does this qualify for exemptions as condos, you might ask? Well, the city extended downtown to go all the way to Averill so that housing could be concluded on Alexander Street. And this also qualifies for downtown urban exemption, a residential exemption. The problem with this really is I frequently attend meetings all over the city. And I look at many of these neighborhoods that I'm driving through and I ask myself, what section of the city is the most distressed and needs the most money? You know, maybe it's the Clifford Avenue area near Conkey. But there's some really bad places on the west side too. Uh, Jefferson Avenue has tremendous needs. Uh, uh, Otis Street is not a particularly good neighborhood. And the farther north you head from Otis, it doesn't get better. So it's hard for me sometimes to think what, the most, what area could most use incentives to get home ownership. The one thing I am certain is it is not downtown Rochester. No question. And yet, downtown Rochester started this with the Sagamore building. The Sagamore building was built um, was, was completed more than 12 years ago and rapidly sold out. Yet, the Sagamore building will never pay full taxes. And the reason for that is, even if you sell the property that you bought, the new owner will get to enjoy these tax breaks again, starting from the beginning. So if you live there for five years and never pay 50% taxes on it, you will be able to 
you will be able to sell the property to a new owner, say your wife, who will then be able to claim a 100% tax exemption on the property for the first year. There was a question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so these tax breaks for living downtown is only for new development? No. Okay. It's for anyone who buys a house that they move into and theoretically live there. So even if it's not one of these developers? No, even if it's not one of the developers. But I asked you a question. What housing is there downtown that's not relatively new? I mean, there's a couple, a small handful of them that are not relatively new. I mean, and most of the older po projects downtown, which are housing, are rental and you couldn't buy if you wanted to and that you bought the whole project and moved into one and then your unit would be counted separate and be you would have 100% taxes on your one unit. But uh, almost all of it is new development. None of it predates 92, I believe. And you think this was Tom Richards. This was, no. This started with Bill Johnson. In fact, it started before Bill Johnson. One of the many, it's been in the news a lot. Oh, I forgot what we're talking about. Oh, the loan game. Um, one of the ones that have been in the news a lot is College Town. And I felt like I was a lone person fighting this project as it was going on as the city was actively trying to give them a HUD Section 108 loan for $20 million. Now, in case you're unaware what that means, the Section 108 loan is a loan which is supposed to be given to, to, to help distressed areas from falling further into blight to provide, to provide housing for low-income people or to provide necessary services to a depressed area, to a depressed area that is underserved by, and their classic example is a grocery store. Okay? It's on their HUD website. College Town received this $20 million loan. And the deal was that, that College Town was going to pay this loan back out of their taxes. So think about this. Some of you are homeowners in this room. Imagine if the city said, whoa, don't pay me taxes. We'll just, don't, don't pay the mortgage on your property. We'll take that out of the taxes for you, and we'll pay that for you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry your pretty little head about these things. And that's what College Town did. It's not a depressed area. Nothing meets the criteria. This is They used money for low-income housing to provide apartments that rent for $2,000 in an area that is not depressed and has three grocery stores in a three-mile area. And the other big tenant of this was a bookstore, of which there were two bookstores before, one at the university and one at the hospital, which closed and moved their operations to the one bookstore at College Town, actually cutting employees. This, uh, uh, and the best thing about this is it was supposed to make a $1.1 million loan payment every year to cover the cost of the Section 108 loan. The taxes it paid last year were $28,000. How was that payment made? Well, you and I paid our taxes, and from the taxes, general tax revenues, this loan is being paid. So, College Town, which doesn't meet any criteria for receiving the loan, which, it, which is not providing any rent break to anybody, which the grocery store has already closed, which was one of the justifications for this, in an area that could not be considered a food desert by any stretch of the imagination is making us, the public, pay for its taxes. Midtown Tower was sold to Morgan and Buckingham, those two keep showing up, Morgan and Buckingham for two dollars, the best deal the city ever negotiated on one of these properties. They got double what they normally did. <laughs> and they did this despite the fact a group of us in the room had a hundred thousand dollars on us to pay cash for that property that they instead sold for two dollars. The uh, building received loans 
for $8,700,000 from the city of Rochester. Like all loans the city grants to these buildings, they're either paid back out of taxes or it's, it's, it's at zero or one percent interest, this one at zero percent interest, of which they only have to pay the interest for the first 20 years. Now if you're bad at math, zero percent interest on any amount of money means you pay zero dollars. Yeah. So they take no payment and at the end of all of these loans, the mayor forgives frequently, uh, freak, sometimes all of it, but no le I, could, I have not found one that less than a third of the total principal was not forgiven. So I call these grants never a loan because there's no payments and they're forgiven. The uh, Eastman Garden Apartments, this is the old dental dispensary. This building, the developer Edgemere, claimed that it was going to be a $23 million project. And if you drive by it on West Main, it looks nice. But the building looked nice beforehand. The, uh, um, this property, uh, the developer said he could not do the project. He had $22 million of the money he needed. But without that extra $1.2 million, there was no way this project gets done. The profit on this building the developer is taking is $2.4 million. All the loan that the city gave them did was double the profits for the developer from 5% to 10%. It was not required in any way a 5% profit just wasn't worth breaking ground for. And so he has, he pays 1% interest after seven years on this loan. So at least some payment will be coming back in eventually. But uh, uh, it is at now, the loan is set for 37 years with no principal payment. And I bet you that means no principal payment. <laughs> Wind Street, downtown. Uh, uh, this was that big project, maybe you've seen it, Duffy trumpeted this building. The new 30-story building that Windstream, that uh, the Paytech building was going to build downtown, that somehow became a three-story building, not new in the shell of the old Seneca building. This building was built by Pike Construction and uh, is a result of uh, Chuck Schumer refusing uh, claiming he would try to block on uh, 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 block the consolidation of Paytech and Windstream unless they signed a contract to move into a downtown building, they signed a 15-year contract with a lease payment of 20, basically $24 per square foot that they will pay on some space totaling not more, not less than 600,000 square feet. That. I've got that number wrong, it's not, it's 200,000 square, 20,000 square feet that they would pay $24 a square foot for. Interestingly, this contract does not say that that building had to be new. The Chase Building, the uh, Legacy Tower, the Midtown Bank Building, the uh, Marine Midland Building, um, the Alliance Building, I can go on, all have more than 20,000 square feet of available space. Any one of whom could have been chosen is the one to move in. The city could even have sold that right to have them bid against each other for how low the rent was going to be and pocketed the difference. That was not the case. Pike built a new building in the city, sweetened the pot with five million dollars of a tax loan, of a loan to them, paid back out of taxes, which would be a three hundred thousand dollar payment a year, which they will take happily out of the sixteen thousand dollars taxes they pay every year. Now, what makes this building most interesting to me? It's a kind of a tiny project, in you know, it is manufacturing for the most part. But that is where the Midtown Plaza used to be. We, the city, state, and federal government spent $170 million tearing that building down. 
The city then, in tearing it down, they damaged the parking garage below, and the city spent over three million dollars of their own money repairing that. And then, because because uh, Pike didn't like the way the ramp entered, they built a new ramp to go in there for another million and a half dollars. Plus, they have landscaped the entire area around it at our expense. They redid roads and sidewalks to make this work. They paid to have they paid our g and &E to do the reconstruction of all the utilities that went into this project. Basically, Pike Construction is on the hook for three million of that eight and eighteen million dollars. And you wish I was done. But I want to look at what this all looks like when we put it together. And I'd like to look at the Sibley Building. Because the Sibley Building if you have an opportunity to break in there and go through and look at what's still there, honestly, the bathrooms, Sibley made those bathrooms places that should be in a museum. The Eastman House does not have as nice looking bathrooms as the Sibley building has. It is gorgeous. It was built, it was at one time the largest department store between Chicago and New York City. And unfortunately, as a result of Wilma Wright, building malls outside of Rochester, and the car economy, uh, paid parking, and many other things. This collapsed in the 70s, is a department store. And since then, since 1980, they've been struggling to find a way to make this work. In 1990, Wilmerite decided he would buy this building. And his original plan was to put a casino in there, because casinos were just starting to be talked about in New York State. Unfortunately, the state would not agree for many incredibly technical reasons, which basically are the same reasons that will make it impossible to put a downtown casino in today because of the, uh, 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 the and I think it's the number nine land purchase from the Seneca Indians. Yeah, back in, 19, in 18... 18 something, um, uh, 1803 or 1804, they bought this strip of land around Genesee River from Lake Ontario down to the border. And this is not and cannot be Indian land. Created the same problem for Wilmerite in the 90s. Felt from Garland? Yeah. Purchase. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And as a result of that, it's it much harder to put it to casino here because the Indians have no claim to the land here. You could lease it for 99 years. They the land underneath the city. What, what always happened, but, but no casino has gone in any of the valid land purchase areas in New York. Anyway, when that didn't happen in 92, he convinced the county to create an MCC downtown, which started paying him at the time a million dollars a year to put the Damon campus there. In 93, he decided that wasn't enough money, and he stopped paying on what he did to get this loan. He had borrowed, he had a $4 million loan from the federal government, which had no payments on it for three years, which gets us to the point in 93 when he decided to stop paying. He also took out, and I have to admit, I had trouble finding what the actual number is. It's either $1.9 million or $19 million. When in doubt, my gut says, go with the bigger number. Um, he took this loan out from the Electrical Union's pension fund and stopped paying the pension fund back in 93. This is Wilmer. Wilmer Wright. Oh. Yes. Just, and, just. and he had a tax agreement that roughly he was supposed to pay $870,000 a year in taxes, which he also stopped paying. That agreement was supposed to go for 10 years from the time that he had a tenant. The tenant he got in, MCC, would have qualified the starting of the taxes break, and he would have supposedly had to start paying $800,000, which he had never paid any of. Ten years later, it was supposed to expire and go on to full taxes. The city never counted that property as full taxes under the argument, why would we, he's not paying. They also never charged them the 18% interest they would charge you if you didn't pay your taxes because he's not paying, we're not collecting, why make the number bigger? So, at some point in 2012, the city owed, this, the, the 
the Tivoli building owed the city $22 million by the city's accounting and $43 million by Alice's accounting, because I can do math. The, uh, um, uh, and at that point, a deal, they signed a new contract with the Damon Center, which was going to pay $5 million a year to rent the space. And then in came the White Knight, wind development, swooped in and bought the building, taking it off Sibley. The city got to foreclose and sell it to them for $5 million, <clears throat> of which $1.9 million went to pay off the Electrical Union's pension fund that they, it was very nice of them. $3.1 million remained, which the city gave wind development as a loan. Remember how loans work in the city. This is a 1% interest loan with no principal paid for 20 years. Like your loan. So, your student loans work exactly that way, right? So, anyways, the, uh, um, this building, oh, and it's just hard to grasp what had happened next. They had four years of this $5 million contract with the Damon Center, giving them $20 million. But that wasn't enough. The city paid them $1 million to build a police substation within walking distance of the public safety building. That's right. You walk down Main Street, you make a left in Exchange Street, and three blocks down is the police station. Okay? It takes you about five minutes if you walk slowly to walk that. But yet they put a substation that distance away from the police station. Well, there's a lot of civil disobedience on that. But you don't need a substation there. You need police officers there. Okay, yes, yeah, a lot of <laughs> And it didn't require building this building or paying wind development $100,000 a year for the next 20 years to lease it. The 5,000 square feet, they paid it almost a million dollars to build. 5,000 square feet. Million dollars to build. Yeah, you're shaking your head, and I know you work in construction, and you're like, that's crazy numbers. Well, you got your walls and your ceiling already there. And the door, so and all the few doors, heat, the and utilities. You're done. A couple of bathrooms. Exactly. This should not have cost anywhere this number. But they were counting, I, I won't even go into what they were charging on, because I looked this over carefully, and I said, you know, the amount of drywall you're planning on putting in. You want to get paid. You want you want to get paid forty dollars a square foot for for drywall. That's a good deal for who's putting in drywall. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy made up numbers that make no sense. But then and but the, the you know they had to do this because eye on the ball. Wind Development's going to do a ninety-eight million dollar renovation of this property. And at that point, they took their hat in hand and went around. And they said, how can we fund this? And it's maddening. Chuck Schumer came in with $40 million of tax credits for this property to give it. And I'm going to read this because I don't normally read things. But there's new market tax credits from Chuck Schumer for $40 million, a Redco loan uh, Rochester Economic Development Corporation loan for one million dollars. Uh, a New York State ESD grant for three and a half. A CIF loan for 1.5 from the state. Uh, uh, ESD is Economic uh, Something Development. Uh, it's that Economic Development Council. It's from them. Um, the facade loan. You've seen the facade of this building? No work is being done on it. None. They are not planning to do any work on the facade, but yet they got a $3 million facade loan. The, uh, um, they have a federal, um, uh, 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 some HRTC, and I can't remember what HR, but it's some form of tax credits for almost $14 million. They have state tax credits for $4 million more. The city has given them a leveraged loan, read grant, for $1 million. New York State has another HRC loan for $9 million. They're getting low-income housing tax credits for apartments. They're going to start at $14 million $14 per apartment, which is only low-income housing. Only people with low incomes will be able to afford that. Uh, and they're getting $11.8 million of low-income housing tax credits. 
And the city of Rochester, uh, the city of Rochester, oh, and $500,000 of brownfield cleanup for a building that has no brownfield contamination. And the, they came to the city and said, you know, we're not close enough yet. Could you please chip in $3 million more million? And the city could not wait to give them a $3 million grant to finish this up using HOME money which is money that is supposed to be used for providing sustainable low-income housing for, uh, uh, for, uh, p for homeowners in distressed areas. Oh. All told, the developer has, met, has had to reach into his pocket from the $6.5 million of property that they own and find slightly more than five and a half million dollars of which they are going to have roughly 200 apartments paying more than a th paying more than fourteen hundred dollars each a month on a building that was basically given to them in which the city has had no effort to not give them more breaks but we're not done yeah. Because they're tax breaks. They're getting, over the next 17 years alone, $67 million in tax breaks. And the city is agreeing to assess this property, which, as we know from the Xerox sale in the Legacy Tower sale, should be assessed roughly $90 a square feet, which would make this worth more than $100 million. He's never going to pay more than $300,000 taxes on it if he ever pays that much a year. What did I do? Okay. College Town. I have been opposed to College Town from the beginning. College Town started with a survey of the neighborhood asking the neighbors what they wanted. And the neighbors said, we want a grocery store. We want a recreation center or a YMCA. We want more green space. We want a bus subterminal. We want there to be more parking, particularly for the hospital. And we want it to be easier to turn left off Mount Hope Boulevard, Mount Hope. And finally, we'd like a bookstore. And the developer sat down to deliver. This property, uh, this proper, in order to make this property usable for what they wanted, they tore down two housing complexes, a small uh, a small uh, uh, mall area and a gas station, all of which were paying taxes, and replaced it with the beautiful college town, and gave the public exactly what they want, as long as all they wanted was a college bookstore. As I've already mentioned, they closed two bookstores and moved the college bookstores over there and did not put in one of the full-service uh, uh, Barnes & Noble bookstores like they have in Pittsburgh. And yet, they came to the public for the $20 million loan. They, they, uh, they insisted that they got city infrastructure grant for $3.3 .3 million. They had sales tax credits. That's right. When, pro when someone collects sales tax on a purchase that you make in College Town, the sales tax money goes to the developer to the tune of $2.8 million. The, they received $2.7 million of brownfield capital because after you tear down the buildings that are there, you pollute the ground and need to clean it up. They received new market tax credits for $5.4 million. The Economic Development Council will not be left behind on any big project like that and add $6 million of money, which is job creation money. And they, uh, 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 they, claim, they got uh, tax credits worth roughly uh, $4.38 million a year, and they promised, and they promised us that this was going to create 582 permanent jobs. And these 582 permanent jobs are going to have payroll of $26 million. Now, this was the first thing that tipped me off, because again, I can do math. And I divided these jobs by I divided the amount of payroll by the number of jobs and found out that they were planning on paying people working at uh, restaurants, 
in coffee shops, in a bookstore, in a grocery store, $42,000 a year. Which instantly told me, someone just made these numbers up. <laughs> None of this was going to be real. It has, what it, it has cost the public already. This is a property, we already talked about the taxes it isn't paying, the loan that we're picking up, but it cost us a gas station, two housing complexes that had over 200 apartments in it, and for a property that now has 150 apartments in it. The, the ones they tore down were low-income housing, the ones they replaced it with are high-income housing. It has closed three restaurants, uh, 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 two stores that were in the little plaza there, and on the general area combined, it has lost, on Mount Hope in that area, we've lost three other businesses as a result of this. And we don't have the grocery store. And the grocery store, I cannot stress how this was never going to be a grocery store. That wasn't the plan. It is, it is the most unique built building I have ever heard of. The grocery store has a structural seal count, uh, uh, base, allowing it to be expanded up to seven floors in case the grocery store wants to become the only seven-floor grocery store in America. <laughs> this was my next clue that this was not designed for that purpose. The public had already rejected, the neighborhood had already rejected telling this to you of our and allowing you of our to put in to put in uh, uh, office space here. They didn't want this to be a large office complex, but the contract the city has with them allows them to turn failed space into, if they can, if a business, fa if a building fails and has no tenants and they cannot get tenants for it in, I think the phrase is a reasonable time, which means whenever the developer would like, to, whenever the owner would like to move ahead, uh, they can rent that property to, they can change that property to be office space and rent it to the U of R. The only reason to build a grocery store that could be expanded to seven floors is because this will become seven floors of U of R offices. And, and they had, I, I have often in my, one of the things I do is I help new local businesses get the permits they need and frequently one of the problems is parking. The city has very strict rules for parking required for businesses. The parking in this space was insufficient for the grocery store alone by the city's regulations. Clue three that this was not what it was supposed to be. This project was designed to be 40, it had received $43 million of public funding, not counting the $18 million the city spent redoing uh, Elmwood Avenue in Mount Hope and the sidewalk in building uh, a street in the area. We spent $18 million more dollars that we didn't need to spend except for this project. And, and if you asked me which street needed most being redone, Mount Hope was not that street. Elmwood was not that street. But they had put but they had put in the middle of Elmwood, they had put those dividers and they needed to come out. And once you pull it out, you might as well redo the street. When you redo the street, you might as well not redo the old water pipes that run up Mount Hope, which are wood actually. And when which are fine right up until the moment you expose them to air and then they deteriorate which means you get to tear the street up a second time to replace those oh wood pipes. So this project has cost us $18 million, numerous businesses, and the jo even the job total, even if that was reasonable, that this collection of roughly 40 restaurants would hire 500 people, even if that was reasonable, the loss of jobs from the closing the bookstores and all the other businesses off up offset more than half of that. And strangely, we gave them tax breaks when the state said to commit the IDAs to stop giving tax breaks for commercial property because it doesn't generate jobs. But we did it anyways. And this is not a unique single thing. This is a list of properties from 2012, development projects from 2012 to the end of 2014. 
that City Council has approved, which are not previously in this. That's right. These are not, for the most part, things I have talked about. They total, in, the land, in those three years alone, they total $530 million of grants, loans, special assistance, and tax breaks City Council has given out in three years. A total, on average, of $170 million a year. And it continues going on today. In cold, why is this important? I mean, yeah, other people are getting money. Am I just a bitter guy because I have to pay high taxes? <clears throat> well, I don't think so, because this is money that could be used for other programs. We don't have weekend, most of our library hours in the summer. Yeah. Most of our libraries don't have evening hours. There are four rec centers that have partial hours on Saturday no recreation hours on Sunday, many rec centers don't have evening hours, Pathways to Peace is down to seven people, gang activity up, Pathways to Peace down, not saying they're related, <laughs> but over and over again, after school programs, preschool for three-year-olds, all of this could be done for the next 30 years on what they've given away in one year. Yep. And so what we've lost is oh, all priorities. these programs. And when we give these tax breaks, we're not giving them for the most part to someone who lives in Rochester and is spending their money in Rochester. We're giving them to someone who's out of town, like Cedar Tower Apartments. When they don't have to, they're receiving rent payments, and that money is not spending, spending any time here in Rochester. And they're not even paying any taxes back to help the area. And so money is fleeing our area, and this is money that is not cycling here, not buying things here, not creating jobs here. And it is discouraged when, when we pick a project like, like College Town to put housing in, and we pick the Sibley building to put in housing, what we are doing is we are making it so a developer or a person who's buying and rehabbing a house has a hard time competing because they have to pay taxes against their competitor who doesn't. This discourages investment in our area from local people, again, actually depressing the jobs they're telling you we're going to get. And as a result of this lost opportunity, we're becoming poorer every single day in Rochester. <coughs> and it shows is we are the slowest growing metropolitan area in the nation, according to a recent study. And poverty is now the fifth highest and is growing faster than any other city in the nation, according to the Census Bureau. We're heading towards a disaster as fast as we can run, and that disaster is called local corporate welfare. And unless something is done about it, we're just, we, we are headed toward, for a Detroit type. Uh, scenario. Thank you. If anyone has it, oh, what you can do about this. More information is always available from Alex White for Rochester on Facebook. You can follow me there. You can follow Alex White on Facebook. I have a website where I post things when I get motivated, and you can find many of articles that I have written and research I have done at alexwhiteforrochester.com. And on Rochester Free Radio, I have, a I have a radio show called Transforming Rochester, and uh, uh, I, which I talk about this almost on a weekly basis with an effort of my co-host to force me to occasionally talk about a solution so it's not so sad all the time. But the real solution is only you can stop these corporate tax breaks by voting not for the same Democrats that have been doing this to us for years, but for new candidates who have made this an issue to make this the thing that we need to do to save Rochester. Thank you. Are there any questions?